In life, everyone has their favorites and their go-to staples, but it is good to go outside your comfort zone every once in a while and uh, try something new. Today's video is brought to you by Shaker and Spoon. More on them at the end of this video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. On the desk today is the TP-Link EAP660HD, a Wi-Fi 6 access point designed for high-density deployments. The 9.5-inch ceiling-mounted AP boasts speeds of up to 1150 megabit per second over 2.4 GHz and 2400 megabit per second over 5 GHz links. At the base of this flying saucer, you'll find a reset button, a 12 volt barrel jack, and a 2.5 gigabit RJ45 connection, with support for PoE+. I really like the inclusion of both power inputs, as having multiple options for deployments is never a bad thing. Given these will work in either structured or mesh deployments means if your backbone doesn't yet have PoE, you'll still be able to get these up and running. To get things started, I do have a bit of a confession, and it relates to my intro. While I always try to keep up to date with every software and hardware trend for small businesses, when it comes to Wi-Fi, well, Unify has just been so damn good for so long, I never bothered to look anywhere else. And it's not that Unify isn't still good, it's just that software-defined, centrally managed, zero licensing, 100% on-prem solutions are a little bit more common than they were 10 years ago. Diving into TP-Link and their Omada management software for this review felt a bit like going back in time to when Unify first burst onto the business scene, and I mean that comparison in the best possible way. Sure, the incumbents are all still there, with Cisco, Meraki, Aruba, complete with their licensing-as-a-service business model. It's just nice to see another major player jump into the hardware business, rather than selling you equipment designed to lock you into support contracts. A review of the EAP 660HD access point really does need to start with the software. Just because the hardware may be impressive on paper doesn't mean anything if you can't control it. And that's where the Omada controller comes into play. You can host the Omada controller on your own hardware or inside of a virtual machine. There's also the option to purchase a TP-Link device with an embedded Omada controller. The most basic controller they sell starts at around $90 and can control and manage up to 100 devices. Installation is pretty straightforward, although running the installer already pops up my first annoyance. Java. And look, I get why this was probably done. Java runs on anything, from x86 hardware, to ARM, to RISC, to pretty much every operating system ever known to exist. But while Java is the second most used programming language, it's also commonly among the most hated. There's even a Wikipedia entry explaining the criticism of Java, both from a programming standpoint, as well as providing a laundry list of security vulnerabilities that have popped up over the years. But it's not like I can be too disappointed in the Java requirement. Unify is built on it too. And that's not the only similarity between the two management platforms we'll see over the next couple minutes. Once Java is installed, you can start up a web browser and configure the controller. The first time you open it up, you'll be greeted with the Setup Wizard, which will let you set up your username and password, add any detected TP-Link devices, and configure your Wi-Fi, SSID, and password. With all that done, you'll be dropped onto the dashboard. Much like Ubiquiti's environment, Omada works best when your infrastructure, top to bottom, is composed of TP-Link devices. But this isn't necessarily for anti-competitive reasons. Both Unify and TP-Link are using SDN, or software-defined networking, to manage devices. Rather than configuring each port on each device inside your network, which is how we used to do things, SDN allows you to simply tell a device how you want it to communicate on your network. Which VLAN will it be on? How does it route traffic? And then just go plug everything in. But getting all that to work means running all the devices on a compatible standard. And at the moment, that means controlling with first-party software. While there's a lot more to be explored on the controller side of things, there's also not a lot that I can do with it with just a couple access points. So I'll have to save the deeper dive for another day. For now, let's turn our attention back to the EAP 660 HD. Overall, configuration was incredibly simple. If you're at all familiar with configuring devices inside Unify, you're going to be right at home here, as the process is nearly identical. Plug in your access point, wait for it to be detected by Omada, add it to your network, and tell it how you want it to work on your network. IP settings, wireless networks, radio configurations, all of it is pushed out to the access point and updated whenever you make a change on the controller that would impact it. One thing about these access points, they are much larger than you think they're going to be. 
As I said, they have a 9.5 inch diameter and are nearly 2.5 inches tall. There is a fairly extreme taper towards the base, which means the point that touches the ceiling is just barely bigger than a Unify Nano AP. Objectively, they're easy to mount, and the mount that holds them up is simple to install. Subjectively, they are definitely not the best looking IT accessory that I've ever seen. If the Nano HD is the Tesla Model S, the 660 HD is a Pontiac Aztec. Sure, they're both able to catch your eye, but for completely different reasons. Moving on to performance testing, this one leaves me in a bit of a tough space. While the access point is definitely capable of multiple gigabit per second speeds, there aren't many 2.5 gigabit per second switches out in the wild. Plugging this into a standard gigabit network port is going to seriously hamper peak performance. I've gone ahead and tested it with both 1 gigabit and 2.5 gigabit links to help provide a more accurate picture of what you might expect if you're deploying one. If you're just trying to ensure connectivity for any mobile device that comes through your door, performance on my Pixel 5a was seriously impressive, managing 720 megabit per second with 15 millisecond latency, and that's with only an AC radio on board. Comparing apples to apples with my Unify Nano HD, the phone managed only 240 megabit per second with the same latency. Moving on to devices with slightly better wireless capabilities, my daily driver laptop is a MacBook Pro M1 with Wi-Fi 6 on board. With the 660HD connected to gigabit networking, I managed to saturate the connection, achieving 890 megabit per second on both the upload and the download, and that's with just 12 milliseconds of latency. This is about as close to line rate gigabit speeds as I have ever seen over Wi-Fi. Moving the access point to a 2.5 gigabit connection, and honestly, I was hoping to break the 1 gigabit threshold on a client. Any client, I didn't care which one. I just wanted the thrill of saying, this computer's Wi-Fi is faster than its LAN port. While on a single PC, I was able to top out a 1 gigabit link, I couldn't seem to crack that elusive mark. What's more, I only managed gigabit speeds when only a single client was connected to the access point. As soon as I had more devices online, average speeds fell down to around the 5 to 600 megabit per second mark. And don't get me wrong, that is still hugely impressive for an access point that only costs $180. Similar performance of an access point would have been $500 and up as little as two years ago. But drag racing cell phones and laptops isn't how I use Wi-Fi in any environment. I see great performance more in the realm of how many clients can I connect to an access point at a time while maintaining acceptable metrics. In an oranges versus apples comparison, my primary access point here at my house is a Unify Nano HD, which is an 802.11ac point featuring 4x4 MIMO. Most devices on this AP can reach speeds of around 250 to 300 megabit per second. With multiple high demand devices running at the same time, it can start to struggle keeping up, dropping down to 100 megabit per second or lower pretty quickly. While I only have three devices with Wi-Fi 6 cards to test the EAP660 with, the performance was still incredible. Running all three speed tests at the same time, my two Macs hit speeds of 500 megabit per second each, and my Plaid desktop held steady at 350. That's 1350 megabit per second combined bandwidth from a synthetic stress test using iPerf3. In theory, a single access point could easily serve an entire household and their device's needs. It could provide Wi-Fi for businesses and offices while approaching speeds that rival gigabit LAN devices. There are obviously a couple drawbacks to the EAP660 HD. Size and looks. Like it or not, those are significant concerns for both home and businesses, with this being far from the most attractive wireless point I've ever seen. After seeing so many companies working on blending in with light fixtures and smoke detectors for so long, seeing the TP-Link stand so far off the ceiling was actually a bit shocking. Being multiple inches off the ceiling with such an extreme taper means it will potentially cast some pretty gnarly shadows, making it look even bigger than it actually is. I understand that size may be an important factor in performance here, but I also see this unit being vetoed by my wife as soon as I hang it up. Despite its size and looks, the TP-Link EAP660 HD is a fantastic entry into Wi-Fi 6 access points. Configuring a model was a breeze, as was getting the access point up and running. Having dual power supply options is a huge bonus, especially if you want to mesh deploy these. But I also don't see many clients being able to use the full bandwidth available here due to the lack of 2.5 gigabit switches that are available on the market. A 2.5 gigabit network switch is required to get the best performance out of the 660 HD, especially when handling multiple clients at once. Unfortunately, I don't see a lot of options out there for 2.5 gigabit network switches that feature power over Ethernet Plus and 10 gigabit network ports for an uplink. 
For testing, I picked up a Netgear desktop unit that can negotiate 1 gig, 2.5, 5, and 10 gigabit connections over RJ45. But that only works on two of the available ports, and it was still $200. Oh, and I still had to use a power over ethernet injector to get the access point working with that switch. Something else to keep in mind when looking at network switches, just because something has a 10 gigabit network port doesn't mean it will support 2.5 or 5 gigabit connections. While I had plenty of SFP plus ports free in my network, I needed to run 10 gigabit down to another switch that could support a 2.5 gigabit negotiation. On gigabit networks, the performance here is still far and above what I've seen out of wireless AC access points. If you're starting to find yourself struggling to keep up with video streaming, Zoom meetings, or even casting games from a desktop to a wireless VR headset, like I do up in my living room, the EAP660 HD might just make for a worthwhile upgrade. Huge thanks to TP-Link for sending out the 660 HD for this review, but just like all reviews on this channel, TP-Link had no say over the content of this video, they will not be seeing it before it goes live on YouTube, and no money changed hands. With all that said, if you are interested in picking up one of these access points for yourself, I will have affiliate links down in the video description. And being affiliate links, I do get a small kickback if you purchase from those, which really does help out the channel. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. If you're wondering what I've been drinking during this episode, this is the Capri Crush Negroni, courtesy of today's video sponsor, Shaker and Spoon. Now, this may primarily be a beer channel, but make no mistake, cocktails were my first love. And as much as I try to keep a well-stocked bar here in the studio, tracking down fresh ingredients can be a bit of a chore, even for items that I consider to be standard, like Peychaud's or Pimento Bitters. That is where Shaker and Spoon comes in. Instead of needing to spend tens or even hundreds of dollars just to try out a new cocktail, they send you boxes based around a single spirit and enough ingredients to mix up 12 drinks. On the table here is the Negroni 2 box. I supply the Campari and gin of my choosing, Shaker and Spoon sends out the supplies and recipes for me to mix up three different cocktails. There's the Pacific Negroni, a cocktail which calls for pandan syrup and coconut fat washed Campari. You know, because everyone keeps that stocked in their bar at all times. The Fruta e Fioni is a hibiscus tea infused Negroni with balsamic vinegar and basil. Finally, the Capri Crush that I have here is a sparkling take on the classic cocktail, calling for one ounce Campari, one ounce gin, one ounce spiced orange grapefruit cordial, along with a couple dashes each of both orange and Peychaud's bitters. Give that a shake, then strain over ice in a chilled glass. Finally, top it off with some sparkling water. Shaker and Spoon is a monthly subscription, delivering a spirit-themed cocktail straight to your door each and every month. Get yourself into the craft cocktail game without running all over town. Go to shakerandspoon.com slash craft to sign up and get $20 off your first box. That's shakerandspoon.com slash craft, and a huge thanks to Shaker and Spoon for sponsoring today's video. Thank you all so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. That is just so good. Now, Campari is a bitter liqueur. I think that's the best way to describe Actually, yeah, bitter. Haha. <laughs> Never realized they put that on there. Yeah, uh, it's an Italian liqueur that you use kind of like bitters, but it's not It's not like Angostura bitters or Peychaud's where it's super intense concentrated flavor. This, honestly, if you were brave enough, you could probably just drink it straight. But it's a bittering agent that you add to cocktails that kind of dries it out. It's similar to adding vermouth to a Manhattan, but it's more botanical. It blends in well with gins and vodkas and those type spirits, and it's not nearly as strong. So what you end up with is drinks like the Negroni, which is a bright, colorful, flavorful drink without being too intense. It's nice and crisp. And honestly, just downright refreshing. Cheers. So I just texted you that I'm filming right now, and I'm going to prove it.